If you are a doctor or other healthcare professional with a mortgage or thinking about getting a mortgage, then today's episode is for you. As we go through just what is going on in the mortgage market and with interest rates at the moment, and more importantly, what can you do about it? So we talk about whether you're a first time buyer, should you buy now or wait and see what happens to house prices? We talk about whether you should go for a fixed or variable rate. And we also talk about something which we don't see talked about much, but it's useful for some doctors, which is an offset mortgage, which can help to maximize your cash savings in the bank. We also go through just some simple tips that you can do to make yourself more appealing to mortgage lenders. And we talk about how brokers work, how they make their money, whether you actually need a broker and the fees. So this episode is going to be useful to so many people, hopefully. And if you do find it useful, it would really help us if you could leave a review and a rating. But more importantly, if you find this useful, tell your friends about it. We're all in this together. And this podcast has grown now to over 38,000 downloads last month, purely because people like you have listened, sent in questions like we cover today. And more importantly, tell your friends about it because it's tough out there at the moment and we need all the help we can get. If you're on YouTube as well, got any questions? Drop them in the comments and we'll try to get to them as when we can. But me and Ed have got a savage on call way to at the moment, so it might be a while. This podcast is for general information only and does not constitute any form of advice and tax allowances and rates are subject to change. There's a cat about to... Okay. So on today's podcast, I'm delighted to welcome Robert Gibbons from Legal and Medical Specialist Independent Financial Advisors for what I think is your podcast debut. Is that right, Rob? It is indeed. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me, Tommy. No, really happy to have you. And uh, since you joined Medics Money, you've been really, really popular. But why don't you give yourself the intro to anyone that doesn't know you and uh, tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. So I'm an employed advisor within Legal and Medical Investments, of course, authorized, regulated by the FCA. We provide independent advice specializing in medical professionals. Personally, myself, I hold the Diploma for Financial Advice and the CMAP qualification, which is specific towards mortgages. I've been advising for around three years now. Previous background prior to that was a financial services, mainly providers. So yeah, very familiar with the financial services sector and very excited to be here today to hopefully help some of your clients understand more around what's been happening in the mortgage market and what they might see in the future. Exactly. So mortgage is your speciality, which is why we got you here today, because it's gone a bit crazy recently with mortgages. So should we start a bit sort of from the beginning? Because mortgage rates have increased a lot in the last few months. So I thought it'd be good to cover a bit about why that is, and then we can get into what people can actually do about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it has been quite a turbulent time over the last couple of weeks and months. We've seen a lot of fixed rates increase within the mortgage market. And I think we're well aware of the recent changes to the Bank of England base rate over the last year or slightly longer than that. They've increased the base rate most recently in September. It's 2.25%, which saw the seventh rise since December 2021. It's the highest level for over 14 years and we'll likely see another rise in the coming days or weeks. But with specific regard to fixed products, I wanted to expose a common myth, which is that fixed rate products are not based on the Bank of England base rate. Instead, they're based on swap rates. Now, swap rates are actually used to ensure borrowing over a longer period of time. There are when two parties agree to swap interest rate payments for another. So specifically with mortgages, it's what lenders pay to financial institutions to acquire fixed funding for a set period of time. Ultimately, fixed rate products are therefore based on what the market thinks interest rates will be and not what they actually are. So historically, swap rates would be impacted by one or two basis points in terms of volatility on any given day. That would be considered normal and more than achievable within markets, let's say. Over the past few weeks and months, however, the markets have been much more volatile and two-year swap rates have seen jumps by up to 100 basis points in a single day. So much, much higher volatility. And that's led to market lenders pulling their products and drastically increasing their rates to match those swap rates and keeping their profit margins intact. So ultimately, several factors have impacted swap rates recently from the war in Ukraine, rising inflation, base rate increases, and more recently, the fall in the value of sterling. 
probably the greatest of those in recent weeks was the announcement of Liz Truss's cabinet's mini budget and the subsequent fall in the value of the pound. The appointment, however, of Rishi Sunak has helped to settle the markets over the over the recent times. And the average cost of fixed rate mortgages has been edging down from their peak. Yeah. And we kind of covered the underlying reasons for that in our previous podcast. I think it was episode 120. And also, yeah, the mini budget, which wasn't quite so mini. One of our most popular podcasts ever was just called Fiscal Incontinence, episode 115. So if you want to have a look at that in more detail, check that out. What I was thinking about today is like what people want to know. No one's got a crystal ball. No one can predict the future. But what are the common sort of things that someone like you look at to work out whether interest rates are going up, down, or what's your, I mean, no one's got a crystal ball, but what's your crystal ball telling you? <laughs> You're absolutely right. You know, that crystal ball element, but ultimately the Bank of England use a number of indicators to determine any rate rises or cuts. I thought it'd be good just to highlight a few of the ones that have seen significant impacts on the market recently and may continue to do so over the foreseeable future. So the first one there is inflation. Of course, the target for inflation is 2%. That's been tracking well above that target rate and still rising. With inflation being as high as 10%, the Bank of England previously said that was a temporary rise. They've now accepted that inflation may hit as high as 11%. So that's going to impact the rate rises there. Also, we've seen official support for low rates disappear or not be as strong as what they are used to being. So the Monetary Policy Committee, who are responsible for changes to the Bank of England base rate, use a majority voting system to decide on how much rates should fall or rise by. Recently, there's been much less support within that committee for low rates to actually continue. So we've seen obviously higher rates come as a result. Another factor may be unemployment levels falling again. So unemployment sits at 3.4% the lowest level since 1974, in fact. However, stronger employment numbers increase the chance of rising rates. The other thing is the strength of the UK economy. So the UK economy went into recession in the outbreak of COVID, but it's since surpassed this and started to perform a bit better. However, the second quarter of this year saw a 0.1% shrink in the UK economy. And with raising concerns that the cost of living, that this might tip the UK back into recession. And of course, weak economic growth reduces the chance of another interest rate rise, whilst a stronger growth will increase that likeliness. Okay, so reading between the lines, accepting no one has a crystal ball, not advice, but you're thinking the rates are probably going to keep going up. Yeah, it's a very difficult climate to sort of second guess, of course. And again, I should say, as you have, no one has that crystal ball. And the information I'm going through here today are purely predictions from a wide variety of analysts and market leaders. With that being said, there are many forecasts that predict that mortgage lending in the UK market will rise by 4% this year but will soon slow to just 0.7% in 2023. It's a big, big drop, and that would be the lowest level since 2011. So that slow growth in the mortgage market may lead to more lenders tightening their lending criteria, which obviously can impact on affordability assessments, how much lending there is available for clients. Yeah. And, you know, no one has a crystal ball. And Jerome Powell is the chairman of the Fed in America. And I think until recently, he was just saying, don't worry, this is a transitory bit of inflation. We're not going to rise rates. And then, yeah, it turns out his crystal ball is pretty cloudy as well. So, yeah, I think no one can predict the future. And I mean, it sounds a bit doom and gloom. Give me some positive news or is it actually that bad? Absolutely. I mean, you know, one of the things I wanted to say there as well, Tommy, is that actually market leaders are also predicting that house prices could fall by up to 15% next year. The average house price in the UK has increased by 50,000 since August 2020. It's made it more difficult for first-time buyers to get onto the property ladder. With the average mortgage rates hitting 6% and daily cost of living increases, there's been significant downward pressure on house prices. This means that households are paying the greatest portion of their income on mortgage payments since 1989. Of course, specific regions have bigger variations in house price changes. So house price growth in London is one of the slowest, whilst the average house price is still the highest in the UK. 
Conversely, Wales is growing faster than any other region with more than 15% growth year on year, maybe due to the demand in flexible working patterns since we've seen from COVID more people wanting those rural homes to live in. But the market is now pricing that the Bank of England base rate could rise to around 5.5% by July 2023. So you're absolutely right. All of that does sound very doom and gloom. But when you see the increased cost of living, rising interest rates it's definitely not as good a place to be as this time last year or even prior to that but there should be confidence in the mortgage market as it's much more resilient today than what it was in 2008 for example loan to value ratios are much lower than the past so around 64 percent of the total mortgage book today is on lower loan to values than 60 percent Comparatively, in 2008, some UK banks had around 50% of their mortgage book in the 80% loan-to-value band. So that purely means we're better equipped to deal with drastic changes to house prices. So there should be a little bit of confidence in that. Lending criteria within the providers has drastically changed as well. It's more stringent than it was in the past. In the years building up to the financial crisis in 2008, over a quarter of new mortgages were processed without any verification of the borrower's income. Today, all income must be verified to confirm the borrowing is suitable and affordable. So there should be a lot more confidence in the market today to be able to deal with the drastic changes that we're seeing. So hopefully that's given people a bit of the background. I wanted to get into sort of questions that our listeners send us in. And we've had a lot of mortgage questions recently, probably because of all the turmoil. So first question is, I'm a first time buyer and I'm thinking whether to buy now or wait a bit and then take advantage of the house price drop in. Okay. Yep. We're actually getting this query quite a lot at the moment and it's very pertinent. So thank you again for raising that, Tommy. I think being a first time buyer is never easy in this market, first and foremost. However, we tend to work with specialist lenders who treat professionals with greater affordability assessments. And that can mean a higher level of lending being offered than that of other providers. Of course, a drop in house price will benefit first time buyers in the form of needing a smaller mortgage, increasing their deposit ratio, impacting, of course, their loan to value and making the monthly repayment smaller for them. The caveat to that, however, is that waiting in waiting for a potential house price drop could mean, obviously, they may drop, they may not drop as much as that. It could mean that in the time you've taken to wait, interest rates have increased by a few percent. So it's a circumstantial thing. I would always say with anyone's situation, it's very much dependent on where you're looking to buy as well. The conversation I tend to have with my clients is what is most important to them and their circumstances now. Is it the cost of monthly repayments and security of those payments? Could it be where they're living? They don't want to be renting anymore or they want to be out of the house they're in due to an expanding family. These could just be some of the reasons that clients may choose to buy now. Ultimately, your decision should be based on the now and not on the what if. Yes, absolutely. The what if should play a part in your rationale behind that decision, but shouldn't really be the be all and end all as it is for the majority, something that's out of our control. Yeah, definitely. I think basically what this question is, is saying, should I try and time the market? And if you're investing, you know, in stock markets, market timing, notoriously difficult because no one can predict the future. If you do know how to time the market, let me know because uh, mm -hmm. I, I need that. But, you know, generally, as you say, I, I like that. Just does it work for you now? Is it a good decision for you now? And timing the market, really, really hard. I mean, I bought my first flat in 2009. And at that point, we were post 2008, the market had dropped, you know, 15%. And they were saying, oh, it's going to drop another 40%. And I just needed somewhere to live. And the house or the flat that I bought was 15, 20% cheaper than it was a year and a half ago. So I was like, yeah, I might buy it. And then, of course, we know what happened. 2009 was basically the bottom. And then it went up from there. So I accidentally made the right choice there and I didn't try and time the market. I just needed somewhere to live and it was cheaper than it was. So I was like, well, go for that. So yeah, I like that. Hopefully I'm not putting words in your mouth there, Rob. No, no, not at all. <laughs> Good. Yeah, not advice. We have to keep saying that. But I think it's important about that because there's a lot of unregulated advice out there and regulated advisors like yourselves have strict code of conduct to adhere to because that's why you're regulated. So too much Absolutely. unregulated. Yeah, we, we just joined TikTok and it is the wild west on there, let me tell you, with <laughs> no regulated advice. Okay, next one is, and this is quite a common question that we get from doctors, because as we go through our training, we get 
pay increments so our income goes up a bit. So the next question is from a doctor. My income is due to increase within the next few months, but I can't or don't want to wait to buy somewhere until then. What can you do? What can you do for this person, Rob? Okay, well, again, we see this a lot with the types of clients we deal with. And often, as you say, with the incremental salary increases, we know, again, of certain providers that will accept future increases to salary around three months before they're due to take place. Of course, we will need to provide evidence of that increase. So quite often a copy of the contract or a copy of a letter confirming that from the HR department. But we can source a mortgage for you based on today's rates and today's house prices, but based on your future income. So absolutely, we can look at that. And it's a good reason to start speaking to a mortgage advisor to look into that scenario more. Good reason to work with a mortgage advisor that understands doctors as well, because it's a really common scenario for doctors. And if you know the right, you know, what the right questions to ask payroll and how to present the information to the lender in the best way, then you're going to get the best chance. So all right, that's helpful. This next one is a really I like really easy, simple one word answers. So it's just going to be like a yes or no, this one. What type of mortgage is right for me? I suppose the simple, easy answer is I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's absolutely on a situational circumstance, isn't it? You know, everyone's situation is absolutely different. I suppose if we look historically over the last 10 years or so, interest rates being so low, it's been a relatively easy decision for clients and advisors to fix in a low rate for a medium to long period of time as rates were only due to go in one direction. Now, however, it's far more uncertainties in the market, knowing, I suppose, the variety of products available might help your listeners to reach a decision on what's suitable for them and their needs. So I suppose if we go through the products available very, very briefly, so of course, we'll start with a fixed rate product, generally considered very low risk as it guarantees the monthly repayments. Generally, a fixed rate will offer a higher rate of interest as you're paying for the security of those payments over the medium to long term. The downside, of course, of a fixed rate is that if mortgage rates fall after you've locked in that rate, you'll, of course, be paying a higher rate than what you could get on the open market and will have to pay an exit charge if you decide to switch out early. We then have tracker products. These are more considered medium risk. Currently, tracker rates are more competitive than fixed rates. Some are as low as 3.5% with fixed rates starting from 5.5%. Of course, with a tracker rate, you are at the mercy of the Bank of England base rate, which it tracks. So if the Bank of England base rate changes, your mortgage rate and payments increase or decrease in line with this. We then have discounted products. They are medium to high risk, very suitable for those looking for the absolute lowest rate now. But discounted products will offer a percentage discount to the lender's own standard variable rate. Very different to a tracker. The big difference here is that it's subject to the lender's own rate and not the Bank of England base rate. So actually the lender could choose to change that rate at any point in time, even if the Bank of England base rate doesn't. We then have variable rates as well, which are more considered high risk, similar to a discounted rate. It purely tracks the lender's own standard variable rate. So again, no difference to what the changes are within the Bank of England base rate. It will purely track the lender's own standard variable rate as well. A product that we see very often or we talk about very often with our clients is an offset product now these tend to come in fixed rate products but an offset product are more considered medium risk very popular among the self-employed population due to their tax savings you effectively keep your savings in a special account or a savings account run by the mortgage provider which is completely accessible the amount you have in that savings is then subtracted from the amount of your mortgage on which you have to pay interest so just as a very brief example, if you have a £150,000 mortgage and there's 20000 in savings, you'll only pay interest on the £130,000. So an offset product can be used like the traditional products, as I've mentioned previously, but it's more the product wrapper that it provides you with. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because this is especially useful, like you said, for self-employed people. So like GP partners who have their tax money sat in a bank account waiting to pay the tax bill twice a year, they could effectively get an offset mortgage, which may may work better because then they're only paying interest on a lower balance because the cash that you have offsets the mortgage balance, basically, right? 
Absolutely. Yeah. Again, I must stress, you know, there's no advice here, of course, everyone's situation is very specific and individual, but absolutely that's the examples that we see within that marketplace. And they are, as we said earlier, they're accessible cash products. So the tax savings that people make each year is then withdrawn to pay that. Yeah. Going to be another non-advice question here, but a lot of people sort of thinking, you know, should I go fixed or tracker? So how do you kind of think about that with your clients in broad non-advice terms? Again, I suppose going back to what I said earlier, it's that difference of over the last few years, interest rates have been very low. It's been that quite simple decision to lock in that rate. Opting for that fixed rate now will still provide you with the certainty of monthly repayments over the medium to long term. It may still be considered as the attractive option with rates still looking to rise in the future. Of course, we're due to see the Bank of England set to review the base rates in the coming days, and it's widely expected they will raise that base rate again to try to combat higher inflation rates. We often see first-time buyers wanting to fix in a rate for a period of two years or more, as they want the security of knowing that their monthly repayments will not change whilst their income is at the lower end of their earnings. Higher earners, possibly GP partners, consultants, for example, may have the greater flexibility to opt for a tracker product that is cheaper for them now, but they're taking that risk that it could increase more than that of a fixed rate in the future. Again, everyone's situation is different. Seeking advice should be your absolute priority with this, but it's good to understand the differences between the variable products and the options available. Yeah. And I think this is something we bang on about all the time at Medics Money is that, you know, everyone's financial situation is unique to them. So just because your mate's gone on a tracker doesn't mean it's the best option for you. So again, you've got to just think about the options and talk to someone who actually understands it and can take you through it, which is really helpful. So hopefully that's helpful. This is happening a little bit at the moment. This next question is. My lender's written to me offering a fixed rate deal. Should I take it up? Okay, so lenders very often write to their customers between three to six months before the expiry of a fixed rate deal to try and keep you as a loyal customer. Those rates are sometimes preferential. They're not always preferential and could potentially be beaten if you were to shop around. The advantage of taking them up on that is that you can lock in those rates up to six months before your current rate expires. So in today's market, that could be very advantageous. If, say, a provider write to and offer a 5.5% fixed rate deal and you lock this in now, you still have that six months to shop around to potentially get a better rate. Of course, if rates were to increase in that following six months, you've got the safety of knowing you've already locked in that rate. So again, you know, with this, I would always stress to take advice because everyone's situation is different. But also, if you do lock in that rate and then shop around elsewhere, there could be additional fees incurred that you may not always get back. So it's worth being aware of the possible upsides and downsides to that. Yeah, definitely. But as a sort of strategy, it's not a crazy one, is it? Because you can basically, you know, hypothetically, you could accept their offer, lock that rate in for six months, and then in five months time, you could reject their offer and get a new one or have a misunderstood. No, you can. You can continue to shop around during that time period. As I said, there could be fees incurred with that uh, option. So it's always worth just understanding the options available to you and the possible charges that you may have from that potential circumstance. But absolutely, you know, that that's the flexibility that is provided for you. Yeah, yeah. Nice. I like that strategy. So there's loads of different ways you can get a mortgage. We alluded to one there. You could go to your own bank and that could work out well. But unsurprisingly, your own bank, if you're with Bank X, they won't tell you that Bank Y has a better deal for you. They're just going to sell you their own products. Okay, so that's the downside of that. You could do it yourself like on an online comparison site. Or you could use a broker who specializes in this and understands doctor's finances and more importantly is whole of market. So why should we choose what option? 
Well, I think taking advantage of using a mortgage broker's services should be paramount to any situation. A mortgage broker will specialize with a wide variety of knowledge, not only in the mortgage market and the lenders available to you. Each lender has their own specific criteria. Some are better placed for the cheapest rates, but have a very stringent criteria policy or lending policy, whereas some will offer higher rates to clients or customers that need specialist lending due to their financial situation. There are some mortgage lenders that also only deal with intermediaries or mortgage brokers. So if you are shopping direct, you're not going to have access to those products or those lenders there. An independent mortgage broker should be able to source you the best deal based on your situation. And also not taking advice means that you and only you are liable for the choice of that mortgage, as well as having to deal with all the sourcing and underwriting requirements that can be quite time consuming for yourselves as well. So ultimately going down the mortgage broker route, you should get the best provider and the best option available to your own specific needs, whether you're self-employed with less than two years accounts, or you're a first time buyer who hasn't yet started your foundation year one, mortgage brokers will be able to utilize the market and make sure that they're giving you the best option. Yeah, definitely. You know, in our opinion at Medics Money, you need independent whole of market. That means that they can get a product from the whole market, unlike your own bank, who, as I said, is only going to sell you their own products. And they need to understand doctors. Doctors pay slips, nightmare. Doctors income streams, nightmare. You need a specialist who understands that, which is why we only work with specialist independent whole of market mortgage advisors at Medics Money. Another thing we do at Medics Money is transparency is key and everybody can leave a review and might put your review link in the show notes because your reviews are looking good, Rob. But let's talk on the theme of transparency about how you make money. So what's it going to cost me ballpark? And because I think transparency is so important in the financial services industry and is not always that forthcoming. Absolutely. Again, you know, Every mortgage broker will work differently within the market. The way that we tend to work is we will charge a one-off mortgage advice fee, which is fully refundable upon completion of the mortgage. So that advice fee is £250. But once the mortgage goes through, we then refund that back to the clients as long as it meets our minimum fee, which, you know, again, is written within our terms of business and our contracts as such. But ultimately, we would we would look to refund that once the mortgage is completed, because we would, as a firm, receive a commission from the mortgage lender to pay us for our time and things. Yeah, okay. That sounds great. And so to clarify, if the mortgage goes through, you get the commission. Does that make how does that affect me if I'm your customer? So the commission isn't payable by yourself. The commission is payable from the mortgage lender direct to ourselves. So no money passes from you. Effectively, then all we would do is if it meets our minimum fee, the, the commission, sorry, meets the minimum fee, we refund back to you the £250 that you initially paid. Awesome. Yeah, I think it's really important to be super transparent on that. And everyone on Medics Money is super transparent, which is why we love working with you guys. So we've covered a ton of ground there. That was so useful. And thanks for taking all those mortgage questions because we're getting tons of them. Like in summary, can you give us some sort of tips to help doctors and other medical professionals, you know, get a mortgage? Absolutely. I'd say the first point of call with any situation is knowing your budgets. You know, what are your ideal monthly repayments? Work out your disposable income per month, the money you have left over after all your bills and direct debits have been taken. With that money left over, how much can you actually afford to go towards a mortgage each month? It's sometimes important as well to try and stress test that money. So what happens if interest rates increase by two or 3%, how would that impact your budget? Could you still afford that? It's important to know your ideal budget, but also your upper ceiling as well, as that's just as important. I'd also then say start saving as soon as possible. It's quite an obvious one, but as a certain infamous brand has as their slogan, every little helps. So the bigger the deposit, the better your mortgage deal is going to be. A 40% deposit is the normal cap for which your mortgage will be its best interest rate offer. And for first time buyers, you should make use of a lifetime ISA if you haven't already for that savings. Also some very simple things like checking your full credit report to see if there are any areas you can improve your credit rating. Being registered on the electoral roll or closing any unused credit facilities can often help to increase your credit rating. And that's quite often an area that we see clients not being so familiar with. Other important things could be not applying for credit within six months prior to any mortgage applications. Of course, that will impact your credit rating and subsequently it may impact how much the lenders are willing to provide for you. Similar to the credit line of things, paying off any unsecured debts where possible. So if you are paying interest on 
credit cards or unsecured loans and you've got cash in the bank readily available, again, everyone's situation is different and it may be that they've got that money sat there for specific reasons, but ultimately it's going to boost your monthly income paying that money off and you'll have less outgoings as well, knowing you're not paying off interest each month. I have to say the most common thing we see clients potentially forgetting to do is assessing and establishing a cover to meet their protection needs. Protecting your assets is as important or should be as important as getting the right mortgage for your house purchase. Yes, it's an extra expense each month. However, finding the right protection for your needs can be imperative to your financial future. Of course, working within the NHS, you'll receive a generous sick pay arrangement. However, it doesn't last forever and ensuring you have the right protection in place for the future should be as important as deciding which mortgage is right for you. Your ability to earn income over the next 30 to 40 years is your biggest asset. So if you lose that asset, how are you going to meet your mortgage payments? How are you going to survive financially? So absolutely looking at that situation as well as everything else should be as important for you. Yeah, definitely. It's often the first time a lot of people actually think about it in detail, but better sooner rather than later. And again, another reason to use an independent and not a restricted advisor there. Rob, that was so useful. I'll drop your contact details in the show notes if anyone likes what they hear. That was such a great summary. Thank you so much for your time and for coming on the Medics Money podcast today. I uh, thoroughly enjoyed it, Tommy. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for the invitation. And I look forward to many more podcasts. Definitely. Yeah. Take care. Thank you, Tommy. Bye-bye.